I come from a country of people who are the key beneficiaries, as it were, of international solidarity. Uh, more than many peoples of the world, we know uh, of the type of support that is possible that can be built from a grassroots, from every city, from every street, from classrooms, in support of the people who are faced with an injustice. Um, 60 years, in 1960, Oliver Tambo came to this very city when the African National Congress had been working on a passive resistance movement in South Africa. And in 1960, the apartheid government crushed the movement and uh, arrested people, banned them, restricting them from making publications, from speaking in any public activities. A decision was taken that Oliver Tambo comes and convinces the world about boycotts, divestments, and sanctions. He arrived in London, I think he spoke to wrong people. Oliver Tambo spoke to governments of Europe, of North America, telling them that the, the key contribution that they can make uh, in terms of assisting South Africans, black South Africans, to realize their own liberation was to isolate uh, 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 the South African apartheid government. But Oliver Tambo also spoke to the ordinary people. Obviously, the case was not yet made. In 1963, he changed the direction together with the African National Congress because of the, the violence that apartheid uh, expressed to our people. And for 30 years of building on one hand a grassroots international movement, okay, for 30 years, building that movement on one hand and on the other, arming people of South Africa to defend themselves, not to liberate through arms, but to defend themselves uh, against the government who knew no other language but one of military violence. After, six, after 30 years, he arrived in South Africa having been struck by stroke was welcomed by a hundred, about 100,000 people in Johannesburg. He could not even speak. In 1993, he died before he cast his vote for a free government in South Africa. I'm back in the same city that he came in in 1960, and that is London, to make a similar case. To make a similar case that he made when he was here. I'm here to celebrate him, to celebrate his spirit. And I'm asking a different question because there is a dangerous discourse that is happening in the international community today around Israel apartheid, which wants so much. It is desperate. It is looking under the, under the carpets, under the seats, looking for laws, international laws, to motivate us or to make a case of why we should intervene as the international community in Israel. But I wonder, what did the comrades in London in New York, across Europe, what were they armed with? Because the most cutting-edge laws in the, in the United Nations that were made against apartheid in South Africa were only made in 1974, after the rugby team was embarrassed here, after cultural boycotts were called, after Barclays, after almost, I think, thousands and thousands of students told Barclays that until it withdraws from South Africa, they're going to withdraw all the accounts of UK students from that bank, okay? What were they armed with? Because there, were no, there was no single resolution in the United Nations that condemned South Africa or South African apartheid. So, you know, apartheid was, was fashionable at that time. Obviously, the nationalists in South Africa could have not said what they were doing is colonialism because colonialism was out of fashion. They could have not said that it was slavery because slavery was, was out of fashion. They called it a policy of good neighborliness confusing the world for many years, okay? They call it the policy of coexistence, okay? That we, as white people in South Africa, need to recognize that we are living differently, that we have different cultures, different ways of living from the indigenous population, and they sought to realize a community of exclusivity in South Africa. That, what, that is what apartheid is. They wanted to create a society of white people only, at the expense of the indigenous population. At the, at the ignorance, the total ignorance of the history of dispossession, at the history of colonialism, at the history of the colonial wars of dispossession of the people of South Africa. They wanted to create a system of separateness, to live only as whites, as it were. That is the ideological basis for apartheid, not the law. The law historically came after. So what were the people, what were the activists of the 1960s, what were they armed with? They were armed with the conviction of political societies that must be organized on the, on the principles of justice, freedom, and equality. Justice, freedom, and equality. That is what must convince us. That is the basis upon which we should move and react to the call that the Palestinians have made to us. 
not an international law. The laws of the world have never liberated anyone. Where was the United Nations when the Rwandan people experienced the genocide? Where was the United Nations? It wasn't there. I've come to make the same call, comrades, that the history of this country, the peoples of this country, know very well. And that is, your governments are not going to listen to a law. Your companies are not going to listen to laws. Your companies are going to listen to you. I've come to make the same argument that the power is with the people. That we have to stop debating. We have to stop fascinating, looking for the facts and, and confirming them in some discourse of legality. Apartheid is there, a, a political ideology that wants to create a community of separateness on the base at the, at the expense of the Palestinian people. It is there. That's what the people of this country, that's, that's the only thing, that, that's all you had to tell them. That's all you had to tell them in those days. A community that was not built, a political community that was not built in the interest of justice, freedom and equality. What boycotts and divestment and sanctions gives us an opportunity is to break this silence, is to break this dangerous discourse, okay, that wants to appeal to the United Nations, that wants to appeal, you know, Margaret Thatcher and Reagan stood to the end, okay, they resisted to the end, but it is the ordinary people, you and I, who took to the streets, who held our universities accountable in the name of freedom, justice and equality. A potent gift that my people received in South Africa. A potent gift, international solidarity, so that we could live in a political community today that seeks to realize those values, those principles of freedom, justice, and equality. A same call has come, comrades, from a people who's, who face a worse evil. You see, in Israel, it's not just apathy. The ideology is there, but it has, it has evolved. What is worse in Palestine is, is that we didn't have to be told that once we've left South Africa, we can't return. Okay? What, what makes it worse is the whole refugee situation. It is the whole denial of the people to return to their homes. Okay? That's what makes it worse. It makes it beyond apathy. It means these people in Israel are close to achieving what nationalists in South Africa did not achieve. That is create a community of separateness at the expense of an indigenous people with the total ignorance of the history of dispossession. I'm saying, comrades, that is enough. That is enough to make us angry about our implication. That is enough to make us angry, to hold our universities, our companies, our governments to account that their relationship with anyone in the world, if it is not in the interest of justice, freedom, and equality, then they must come down. Then they must come down. So that is the same call. And BDS gives us that opportunity to once more breathe and drink out of the cup of freedom. It gives us that opportunity to redeem ourselves, okay? to renew our political institutions, to renew our political cultures, to renew our spirit of political community, okay? It cannot be true, okay? It cannot be true that on the face of the world today, a people still exist who think they can survive with a system of separateness at the expense of others. It cannot be true that what we are continuing to do is to sit and talk all the time, that what we're continuing to do is to sit and debate. Is it apathy? Is it not? Is it like South Africa? Is it not? <laughs> It is a violation of a fundamental right, of the fundamental principles that we must hold so dearly within our hearts. The principles of freedom, justice, and equality. Okay? That's, what we, that's the intervention. That's what the call is about. That is what it means to us in South Africa. It's not, it, it's not only because we have the same lived experience. It is because it is an insult to the values that we stand for. Okay? It offends us that our governments are involved in the whole gameplay of Israel apartheid. It offends everything we represent, everything we are. Okay? And if we are people who love freedom, justice, and equality, if we say that we have built our communities on those values, then action through boycotts, divestments, and sanctions is the next step. Next time I want to come to London, I want to stand on the picket lines. 
Next time I want to come to London, I want to go and occupy the Israeli embassy. Just like these people of this country, of the generation before you did, they didn't have the law on their side. They were armed with the conviction of freedom, justice, and equality. Amanda.